I think one of the reasons is in the Byron because previously he was used to Byron. Yeah. And after many years he went to China. Uh, people around him actually in no wise believe it. If you are living in an environment where there are no believers, it is very hard for you to keep believing. I want to use it that word. Uh, I want to use the word hard because I think you can be a believer. I think it's not a believer. But when you look at what happened in that life, first thing you hear now, and then later on you talk to people that are not believing, what hardship or trial has he been through? And if he hasn't got a right doctrinal understanding yet around trials, combat, and hardship, then when he goes through it alone, there's no one around him, no other believers around him to say, why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Can you look at it, look at it from this perspective of him? Talk about it like, right, I see. So without that feedback, when doubts come, you don't get the feedback of life, the word of life, and of course you're going to And that's exactly what the hard ground theory is about. The roots can't go deep. So when the sun is supposed to rule its hand, you can tell us the sun rising up on the day, the hour after it's done. So you were, in America, you were being in an environment where yeah, it's just sort of a given. Most people are Christian there. They find it actually, we have up in a previous church, we had some people from America that came over to do work. It was a church plant that I was in, and they couldn't believe how secular really Australia yeah. was yeah. that we, you know, that we're not able to put things in people's letterboxes to do with Christian things, and yet they were quite shocked that they're in an environment that is a very Christian environment, and. I would think you can talk openly and that sort of thing. You've got that support. Even the talking openly part, here in Australia we're obviously a democratic country, but we have a lot more uh, of different forms of socialism. The good and the bad. And the good we get free schools, we get free hospitals. But the bad side to it for me of socialism is where you get this pressure like things like political correctness. And political correctness can make people nervous to even open their mouth and say something. So again, someone here is believing and they come later on in their life, they're going through trials, the sun rises and it's beating down on their plant, on their seed. They get trials and instead of getting a bit of fresh water, oh man, I'm having a hard time. Why, what's going on? Oh, this and this and this, you know, and, and I wonder where God is. And the person says, well, let me give you another perspective. Water, water, water on the plant. And the plant says, ah, thank you. So, you know, I would say that your friend was genuinely believing, but then when the hardships came, there wasn't that support, that rain, that support, that breaking up the hard ground that comes from fellowship and community. Yeah. Now, what we're going to try and do, the two things as we go through today's parable, and we'll obviously go through next month as well because we're not going to get through it all. Two things we'll keep in our thoughts. How is this applying to day one spiritual work? Which, by the way, is all about light, the sunlight, the heat, sunlight. How is this applying to day one? And also, what does this mean inside of me? Because the first, our first levels of thinking, as you rightly said, Guan, our first levels of thinking is, am I good soil? Am I hard ground? Am I weedy, full of worries and cares, or am I just unbelieving full stop? Where the reality is, we will be a mixture. Different areas of my soul will be really rich to God, 
and other areas may still be quite hard to God or some areas are just not even interested. So that, that mixture and the beauty too of, of the spiritual sense is it becomes much more difficult to judge people when you're letting the word work on you. Oh, okay, am I having a, a good soil moment or am I being hard towards God moment sort of thing? Okay, so... There was something that... Um, really jumped out? Yeah. With the fruits, that some people are 100-fold, some are 60-fold and some are 30-fold. Yes, yes. Yes, so... And I suppose through over time and things, yeah, that sort of fluctuates the fruit that... Which helps lean towards that idea or the, or the concept, I'm saying it's the truth, the truth that this is really all happening inside us, the different soils. We're not just one soil. And it's, it's so easy when, when we have that kind of, it, it's a part of the external world. We have that kind of view, it's, it's kind of easy. Well, if I'm over here in the good camp, then you're in the bad camp. You know, that person over there is in the bad camp when really we're all dealing with various mixtures of, of what's going on in our life. And there's a lot of Christians that can become very competitive with yeah, being better and that person is doing worse. It's yeah, I'll, I'll take it that away. Take on it. Yeah, yeah. The soil over time, the rotted material, which is the trials that oh, yeah. were rotted, becomes nutrition. So we'll say manure or um, dead animals in the soil. It, at the time, it, it stank, it was putrid. Over time, that becomes a part of the soil and it gives nutrition to Absolutely. the plant. Absolutely. So, in other words, those trials and the pain, the putridness becomes nutrition for you. Yeah. But you can either go two ways. You can use that putridness, to, to say, to Produced. not grow, it can yeah. be acidic and make you, or it can make you grow stronger. I don't know. No, no, no you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, that's what last Sunday's message was all about. The fellowship of his suffering. You know, those moments where we're suffering are our trials, and if we don't waste them, they become opportunities to go deeper into your relationship with the Lord. You know, and, and you're absolutely right, Chris, and I'll, I'll back it up by saying another parable the Lord told where a tree is not being fruitful, and in the tree, in the parable, it comes up, dig around the roots again and put dung on it, that it may possibly produce fruit. And that meaning of the dung there is getting the goodness out of our past trials. It's exactly what it means. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... We're going to read the second half as well, which I put in there because it, it, it's actually where the Lord Himself. Oh, it's nice. oh, lovely. I was hoping to see you. Yeah, I have to send the girls to to fill some chair. Come, come sit down. Come sit down. Yeah. You got here, and that's what matters. <laughs> that's lovely. No, no. Yeah. I'd rather you late than not at all. Yeah, that's okay. Any time. Thank you. So we're going to finish reading the, the, the parable. Yeah, sure. The sower sows the seed. You know it, yes? Yeah. <clears throat> Before I do, I'm just going to re repeat here from Secrets of Heaven, paragraph 20, because we're going to keep holding these two ideas in our thought. One, how does this parable help me with day one spiritual yeah. work? Mm -hmm. And two, how are all of the ingredients of this parable inside me? Not just, I'm good soil, I'm bad soil. Yes, yes. How are all can different... Be, can be four together. Yes, which is Very why... Yeah. Which is why, as Jane was saying, sometimes it's 100-fold, 60-fold, or 30-fold, depending on our states. Okay. So here's what Trimble says in, in Secrets of Heaven, paragraph 20. He says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The first step is taken when we begin to realize that goodness and truth are something transcendent. People who focus exclusively on the externals do not even know what is good and what is true. Everything connected with self-love and love of the world or worldly advantage, they consider to be good and anything that promotes those two loves they consider to be true. And it's, it's an important 
passage because it's telling us when we approach sacred text to go for that deeper light. To not just look at it in externals, but to look at what is this, what's the internal of this in me? You know, what is the Lord saying about it in me? So, Jane, would you read the next bit? Yes. Parable is Matthew 13, 3 to 12, but we're jumping down to 18 to 23 because the Lord himself is going to explain it. And could you get a better teacher than the Lord himself? Let's, let's read. Hear ye, therefore, the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth, heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Receive it. Yet have he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. Or endures for a while, yeah. Okay. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Hey, just pause for a sec. That's what you happen to you, you know, possibly happened to your friend. He had this faith at this point in his life, and then many years later, what trials or tribulations did he go through so that he was caused to doubt God? So that's, yeah, challenge, yeah, keep going. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth, which also beareth, bears fruit, and brings forth some and a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Right, so depending on my states, where am I at, some parts of my life are being really fruitful, thirty. Maybe some parts are, uh, have really been broken down. There's the plow man breaking that ground. Broken down and there's real lots of fruit, sixty. And then maybe, you know, you've become an angel. Mm. And there's a hundred percent fruit in your life. Sometimes. That's, that's, <laughs> sometimes. That's the goal. I like that. That's the goal. Beautiful. Any thoughts or comments on that? Well, I think of uh, ex-drug addicts or criminals. Yes. So they've lived that life where they couldn't grow. So eventually they did grow and they used that goodness to, for fruit for people to get out of their situation. And I like to think of people who are struggling with drugs or even crime. I like to think of them as people who are coping with their states of consciousness, the only way they know how. I mean, we, we, we're learning to drink deep of the cup of God and deep, drink deep of, of the joy of the heart, that, the, the nectar of heaven that's not easy to access. But once you learn how to draw from the Holy Spirit, the Lord says, you're going to have a cup, a pond, a stream, no, rivers of living water coming out of your belly. That's a good promise, isn't it? You know, not just just a little drip, drip. But we've got to learn to drink deep of the Holy Spirit, and then we find that things like drugs are not. We don't need that. We're not needing because we're learning to deal with all the pressure and all the states that the world throws at you through the Lord. So I, I like to think of it that way because that helps me have compassion on people who have taken that path. I have compassion on them rather than judge. I don't want to judge. Well, I witnessed something this week, a stolen car, and ouch. It was an Audi and it went flying down the road. It was frightening. And it just missed this bus. And it, oh, it was frightening. It almost went into a childcare centre. It went up the curb and, oh. and the door flew open. <gasps> and my brother's like, profanities. And all I could think of, that's someone's son, that's someone's brother. Yeah. I could think of that. I thought, of course, I thought of people around, but I was thinking, how's that family feeling for this person? That's beautiful, Chris. I thought the same thing about wars. Imagine being in a war, staring down the barrel, and you're told, that's the enemy. And that enemy is also being told, you're the enemy. You know, I, I tell myself, somebody's son, somebody's daughter these days, somebody birthed that person, labored, cared, that's someone's brother, sister, mother, uncle, auntie, that 
someone loved. And, and it's just, you know, I struggle with those kind of things. That puts things into perspective. And it's, it's makes it a lot easier to forgive, I think. And beautiful. Okay, okay so, so I'm going to point out one thing that jumped out at me when we read that parable earlier. I've often used this parable, and it's a good, good tool for you too. You're talking to people and they go, well, I don't know about this whole deeper side to the Word of God thing. I think you could be making a bit too much of it. Well, Jesus himself says it. The disciples say to you, why are you talking in parables? Now, you actually find out in that same chapter, it says, without a parable, he would not talk to the crowds, to the masses. So he talked one-on-one -on -one with the disciples like we are now. But as soon as there was a crowd, he would only teach in parables. Hello, Dr. Mellon. No, come, come. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My heart is made even more joyful. Thank you for hearing about it. That's good. So, so Jesus then says, the disciples say to him, we don't get this. We're not getting it. You're a teacher, right? Yeah. Well, why are you talking in, in stories all the time? Now, if you ask anyone, Christian or not, why did Jesus talk in parables? The most common answer that will just pop up in their head is, oh, well, they're really good for us to learn from. Think about children. Think about children love stories. Don't we all learn from stories? That's why he did it. It's a beautiful answer, but it's wrong. Completely 180%, 180 degrees, wrong direction, wrong, wrong, wrong. What he says here is actually the opposite. He says, why are you speaking to them in parables? He said, because it is given to you, the disciples, to know the secrets of the parables. Right? It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, it is not given. For whosoever has shall be given more, and whosoever has, shall, and he shall have an abundance, but whosoever has not, from him shall be taken away even what he has. And you go, why? Why would you hide the truth from people? What do you reckon? Why, why would we, why would the Lord hide James? Get on your street! No, I don't know. But I'm just thinking, yes. is he saying it in a story so that people do listen? Because it's much more interesting to listen a story and you've got that hidden truth so some people the light bulb is going to go on but people are going to come okay. and listen let's go with that idea let's say they'll, they'll go with the story because they like the story they'll listen to it but if they're a wayside it's going to mean nothing anyway because the word's just going to bounce off their mind just like the truth of parables often bounce off our mind and do nothing it's all about keeping us in freedom. It's all about not forcing truth. Truth is a dance partner that you must learn to take steps with. And truth reveals itself very gently and carefully so as to not hurt us. I'm telling you the truth. It will hurt us to have too much truth too quickly. Hmm. Was he also... Too much too quickly. Was Come he on. also doing it because he wanted to be contrasted against the Pharisees, which were very strict and very rule-based, that they presented everything in such a structured, rule-based way. I like that. Way. I like that. I mean, the, this is the Son of God as opposed to men trying to teach about God. This is the, so the God in flesh. So sort of emphasize that, yeah, that, well, I mean, his disciples had grown up in yes. that society where yes. it was all about following rules, but... Oh. Yeah. No, it's beautiful, Jane. I like that. Here, I'll give you the I'll give you the full answer. Why did we turn up in clothes today? Why not come naked? We got nothing to hide. Because we protect what is sacred. We cover what is sacred, so it doesn't get abused. Right? We we protect. We clothe. See, God is goodness, and he clothes that goodness with truth. But that truth, it, it's a reflection, or it takes the form of goodness, but it is not goodness. Does 
I know. But in heaven, it is. In heaven, you cannot separate truth and goodness. They're one. But on earth, we need the truth given to us in a form that we can receive. So it's given to us like clothes. That's why the Bible says you will get rid of filthy clothes and be given white, shining, clean linen. It's talking about the mind being lifted out of wrong external thinking, fleshly thinking, being lifted up into much higher, beautiful, angelic thinking. Or if you're Adam Eve, you might not need clothes at all. You're so well situated in goodness. Until you ruin it, of course, in that case. <laughs> I mean, children are in that clothing all the time. Little children. I have mean, a question. So is that parable, is that related to spiritual meanings behind script? Mm -hmm. So are they, I'm just trying to get my head out. So they, they are related in a, in a roundabout way. Like if we, we find that spiritual meaning of a certain verse, mm -hmm. is that a kind of parable, like in our mind doing it? It's just everything's parables. Chris, here's a simple way. What is this external reality we're living in? It is a manifestation of deep spiritual principles that we can never conceive of, really. You know, every, there's millions of forms of good, so therefore the world takes so many different forms. Because that's the idea that I think why the Lord wanted us to look at spiritual meanings is we look beyond, he wanted us to use our, 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 our brain as well as our physical side to look beyond. The way I'm thinking of it is if we look at a car, we look at, oh, I like that car, I'm going to buy it. But we've got to look beyond that car. What's the gearbox like? What's this? It's like, got the seats. Yeah. Can it tow? Is it practical? So, yep. I don't know. It's just so I'm Chris, sure. you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a delight. What does it say in Proverbs? It is the glory of, of the Lord to conceal a matter, and it is the glory of a king to find it out. There's a delight when we dig into the word and we get to that deeper. That's a meal. It's delightful. But, you know, I mean, you're going to go right out there. And husband and wife, there's a time for them to throw off their clothes. They don't need them if they're making love. But then if you're going to go out and do some welding, you put the goggles on in the right clothes, you know, you put the right clothes on for the right activity. And that's what the truth of what God's word is doing. Here's what Swimble says. Swimble says that truth is so transcendental. That's why I read that verse before. It is so transcendental, we can't even come close to touching. We never will. It's God. But as it comes down to the heavens, it takes more suitable forms, or what Swimble calls the appearance of truth. Relative truth is what we call it here on Earth. It's relative. So we, you know, do you learn ABC anymore? No, it's not relative anymore. You've moved on to words and language and poetry. And, but when you're little, it's A, B, C, D. So depending on your spiritual development, you're learning a truth that's the right garment for now. And then when you get to more elevated states, you change those garments, or the truth takes on higher forms. Does that make sense? Mm. And it's all there in the parable. The, the word, these parables are the word of God. Mm. So when the light of heaven finally makes its way down to our dimension, mm. it takes the form of parables. Which is why in the New Church we say Genesis to Revelation is parables. The whole thing. Some of it happened. A lot of it happened in history too. Yeah. But it's still recorded because of its parabolic power and it contains the truths of Jesus Christ. The parables are exciting, because when my boys come home, I've got homework, I was going parables. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're puzzles. Yeah, it is. It's, it's just, and it just opens up pathways everywhere. Well, I'm promising you, Chris, they will go on opening up forever, these parables. Angels today heard us reading this, and I promise you what they were getting from it would, would wipe our minds blank with how incredibly transcendent it was, what they were getting from it. But we get glimmers of how they think. We're learning, you know. That's why Romans 12 says, don't be like the world. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind through the word of God. Now, on one level, the word of God is called water. That's the washing of the mind. But yet, on another level, it's also called wine. There's nothing like a glass of water on a hot, sunny day. But then in a meal, 
a glass of wine can be just perfect. Unless you don't, you know, don't, don't know, you may not drink wine. But it's still the word, it's still the truth, but it's expanding and revealing itself in newer and newer and newer ways. We're not going to get to heaven and go, I'm tired of all of this. We're going to get to heaven and go, more, sir, can I please have more? We will. And he won't hit us or say, go away, hold up. Oh. He'll say, of course you can. Because to he who has, more will be given. But he who doesn't have a love and affection for that truth, even what he has, a simple intellectual knowledge of it, will be taken away from him. See, this feeling we're getting about what you're talking about yeah, yeah. is, I want everyone to feel that. Yeah. But yeah. I don't. And as I always remember what you say, and I've used it quite a bit, it's give them a taste of salt. Give them that taste, don't marinate them. Don't drown them in salt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just that taste. And, and I, like I've said before to non-believers, and you'll say a parable, I, I use the, the sawdust in, in, the, in the eye, but I have a long mm. line. Mm. And they go, oh wow, I like that. Mm. Little do they know. That was, that was the words of Jesus. Mm. That, that's so true, Chris. It's, it's, so, it's so beautiful. In my opinion, the reason Jesus would have chosen parables was to address to the common people. Because I think he was born in a time where uh, there were Socrates, there's Confucius, and all those top class philosophers who were talking philosophy. The, the tough language or a mysterious language which reaches only the top layer of the society. And many could not even understand it. And he says, what is no thyself, for example. So Jesus would have studied the whole environment, and he doesn't want to reach those top class people. No. He tried to reach the common people, sure. who may be like a layman, who are not the people. So your storytelling is a beautiful way of reaching the children and the of course. layman. No, so the, when the moment the layman receives it, they are they they are not the spiritual community or those Pharisees and all these big big group of people. Not the common people. So he was the one who revolutionized this concept of you know, don't reach all the top layers. Go down to the bottom and reach really? the common people. Yeah. And so if they understand the message. The truth is revealed because they are the people who, who long for truth. Mm. That's it. Don't even question about the truth. You know? They're thirsting for truth. That's that's Long it. People who are suffering and don't know about God, disease, so many other things. They're longing for the truth. Mm. So beautifully as explains. You know? But let's not forget. Yes. Let's not forget the sea is not the tree. It's yeah, the, yeah. Promise the, tree. the promise of the tree. So when the Lord's sticky, so you're right. But see, from the Lord's perspective. He's not thinking like man. He's thinking, where is the top, the top class in society? And he looks in the heart and says, where is the Holy Spirit? Yes. That's the top class of society. You can be the most humblest, poorest farm man on earth, but if your heart is open and hungry to God and God dwells there, there is the top class. And such a teaching will go in the mind of a man like that or a woman like that and it will unfold. The sea will break and it will unfold and they will get those higher, the branches, those higher understandings. Meanwhile, the so-called intellectuals will still be trying to deal with a parable. Uh, I'm good, so you're bad. It's like, no, you've, you've <laughs> you know, They're thinking down on that external level. But, but, with the whole, but you're absolutely right. The Holy Spirit, he throws the seed out because only those that have the Holy Spirit will grab hold of that seed and give the n nutrition that it needs to become the tree of life. Let's keep going, shall we? Beautifully said. Thank you. Beautifully said. So let's read the introduction. Spiritual progress is comparable to growing a tree. Or maybe in some parables it's a vineyard. The process begins at the seed level. There's the, the most basic word of God, the parable level. And then culminates in eating the fruit of the tree. There are many stages in elemental environments the advancing soul first needs to confront and overcome before the spiritual delights of the eating heavenly fruit can be experienced. Now the sun rising at, uh, in the midday and burning the tree because it doesn't have enough roots or water is that individual missing out on the fruit because they gave up on the process when things got hard instead of enduring. 
I don't think he said that in the parable. Endure for a while, but then does it. So even before the seed can take root in the soil, various states must be worked through. So I've got to plow my mind. My mind needs some plowing from time to time. In the parable of the sower, the Lord rightly highlights how 75% of the time there is a failure in the initial process of the seed germinating in a potential new life force. Isn't that interesting? 75% of the time the Lord's going to fail. He's not going to fail, but from our perspective, he threw seed out there and 75% of the time it didn't even produce anything lasting. That, that's encouraging for me. How tolerant is the Lord of me when I'm only producing fruit, you know, one, one quarter of the time? All the effort he puts into me, only one quarter of the time am I producing any, any fruit. If I stay with the process. <laughs> okay, so he also, uh, sorry, uh, there is so, there is much the advancing soul can do to assist the initial process. We need to approach the word with respect and reverence, reminding ourselves that the word is the Lord. We can also practice a life of thoughtfulness and care for the welfare of others and thus prepare the soil of our hearts for the entrance of new truths and goodness. Now, if we do that, and that's why we're here, we're here to study the word and get those right teachings. If you do that, then later on when that sun is midday burning hot, you're going through a trial, and I think we've all been through trials in the last two years, Actually, I promise, promise you, every year you've been alive, you've been through trial. But if you've gone through trials, that's when the time of studying the Word of God really helps you the most. You, you've stored up a bit of water, and you've broken the hard ground, and the sun comes and you pour that water on there, it's like, ah, oh, and you get through the hottest part of the day. All right, so, Dr. Noel, do you want to read a couple of the, of the spiritual meanings? And he? And he spake many things unto them in parable, saying, The power of the Logos being manifested through laws of correspondence. Okay, so God created the universe by? His word. He spoke. Yes. So anytime the Lord is speaking, there is something powerful and creative unfolding. And he spoke. Take some more. Behold, he has so your great force into the soul. The Lord divine love seeking to fill the advancing soul with the bliss and happiness of the heavenly life. And when he saw some seeds fell by the wayside, the power of the world in seed form seeking reception but not finding any affection into the reciprocation. Does that make sense? Yeah. How many times has, uh, have I missed the Lord? How many times today have I already missed him? But, it, but I'm just so glad he's patient. They go to our children. They yes! Don't to us. <laughs> they don't listen to me! That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. And the powers came and devoured them up. He even set his states through the lower ego, consuming truth and goodness in any form they are tempted to take. Now, I'll just say there, when speaking parables, you'll notice that Jesus uses birds as thoughts, that are particularly coming from spirits. Could be good spirits, could be bad spirits. But ultimately, there is only, ultimately there's only one good spirit, the Holy Spirit. And what, what correspondence do we get in the scriptures for the Holy Spirit? The white dove. White dove. Like Noah, the white dove. The white dove. So this, you see how the language is sort of begging us to work with it. So if the white dove is the Holy Spirit, then these other birds that are devouring God's word before you get to have a, a chance uh, will be evil spirits. I'll tell you what, they doves are very fertile. I had them and they were like rabbits. <laughs> I started with one, I've got another. I ended up with, I'm not kidding, about 30 doves. I had to give them away. Oh. But yeah, anyway, I just thought, well, oh, that's a good thing to be fertile about, though. Yeah. Doesn't God always do things in, in incredible fertility? Like, just everything he does is so abundant. That's beautiful. But contrary to Dao, is the crow. Oh. That's the Satan's angel. 
Before you said that, I'm glad you said that. Before you said that, I was thinking to myself, remind everyone that every, I mean, in the beginning God created everything good too. So everything has a positive or negative meaning depending on context. I like to think, someone said this to me once that I've never forgotten it. You know, the crow reminds us of Noah, doesn't it? Ah, ah, ah. So it's all, but, but you know, like everything God made is good, but its use, is it being used for good or is it being used for bad? So in this parable, the birds here are being used to represent an evil spirit. But there are times like when Elijah or Elisha? Elijah was fed by the raven. Mm -hmm. yes. The ravens would bring him food. Yes. Yeah. Now you go, well, what does that mean there? Okay, there are lesser thoughts that we're having. They're not as pure or high. They're lesser thoughts, but they're still feeding us something of God and taking the next step, bringing us to that next step. So it's all context, but I like what you're saying. In, in general, black might be something dark, uh, and white something light in, in general, but even in Genesis 1, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and it was good. Yeah. Well, I'm even, even, about, even black can be good, can't it, in God? Isn't that well, beautiful? Well, I'm wondering about this, about the crows, but I was having a bit of a bitter moment with one of my sons, I won't say in particular, and he was on board, on board, and he, he's looking around, we can hear these crows, and these crows were trying to get into a sandwich, <laughs> and it was wrapped up in glad rap. So my son went out amongst this argument and went out and unwrapped this glad wrap so that crows could get to the sandwich and the crows came straight in and stuff and I said, oh that's beautiful. What a, what a beautiful thing to do. So I think out of that tension between him and I, it just reset it the whole reset wow. the whole situation. Wow. And we, so we tried looking up crows, what it was about, and Dr. Noah mentioned the crows and we're like yeah, because it was only ravens that were there, and I, I can't really remember, but it was more physical, yeah, so it's more, yeah, less spiritual, is it more the sort of I try physical to, type, yeah. I try to go to context always, so if I'm, if, if that was me. The whole world, I think there is a physical world, which is natural, yes. and there is a spiritual world, which is uh, heaven. Yeah. So the, 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 we are all in a, in a natural world, belong to the earth. But at the same time, we have the spirit which has come down, so we are we are to to nature. Yeah. The physical nature, which is the body and the earthly components, and spiritual, which is divine. So we are we are conflicting between these two. Right? There is a physical, there is a spiritual. But we don't try to convert this physical into spiritual. This is where all the problem comes in. The whole process should be, we should not be physical at the time of our death. We should be, we should be transcended to a spirituality at the time of death. This is the evolution process. But if you remain to be physical, then we cannot go to the heaven. And that's exactly what Blake was saying, you know, William Blake, who was a big reader of Swinburne, in his poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. When we transcend, this matter becomes our friend and our servant. And it all, all, all the good in it 
is just a blessing to, to the higher purpose. But like you say, if you keep working from the bottom up, and, and you're just creating problems for yourself. It's, it's so true. Okay, so what I would do with the crow, I think I love what you did, and I think that's the right way to do it. But what I would do is I go back to just neutralize. I sort of neutralize things first, and then sort of lean towards the good or the bad based on the context. So for me, if you saw a crow, I would go bird, thoughts. I won't say bad thoughts or good thoughts, I just say birds, thoughts. That's a very neutral. Now in the context, your son went out and fed those birds and that was an act of compassion and thoughtfulness. And what I would say is there are things in him, thoughts, ideas, that he is not getting fed. And he's looking for a way to feed these thoughts and he'll be at rest. But as he's trying to sort of deal with this world that us humans have thrown at him, wrapped in plastic and all that sort of stuff, he, you know, he, he's struggling and wrestling and trying to deal with the things of today. And that, that act of compassion was a solution. Something like that. So I wouldn't, I'd start at a neutral level and then look for the positive and negative in the context. Everything is about context. What were you going to say? What I to say is uh, he was not fed sufficiently for him to think of feeling, is that what you're saying? Inside him, maybe the conflict between you and your son at that point is a result of the process of today, living where we grow up. And I'm going to come straight out and say it, I don't care that I'm being recorded. Our schools did a very foolish thing. They took God out of the schools. I know they're going to a great school now. When you take God out of society, you're robbing people of that higher thinking process. And so, as you're growing up in life, you're happy to deal with whatever life is throwing at you instead of bringing the, the, the proper spiritual knowledge in to help them deal with it. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. but I think, you know, you may be having a more compassionate heart yeah. than maybe the parents have. <laughs> so his heart is opening up to the compassion of the birds. And we are only observing. Still, you know, we are not going and feeding the crow. We are only observing. Oh, our son is doing this. So his heart is sensitive to yes. the cry of the crow, which is compassion. That's nice. The ultimate goal of any human being is to be compassionate to the bird. And I'll be honest, I found it entertaining trying to see them get that. I wanted to see if they get it. Yes. And I don't know, that might be harsh, but he, he couldn't. Yeah. He, he had to go out and open it. You wanted to watch the ingenuity as they found yeah, a way right. to get in. And you see them work together. The one would peck here and try and the other would peck here and they're trying to undo it. And I thought, well, this is nature at work here, you know, trying to get a man made uh, piece of bonded chemical to get to the organic goodness that's inside it. Yes. And in every conflict, I love what you say there, in every conflict there'll be a breakdown in communication or common union. Be a breakdown in that communion, communion, and so you start looking at you saying, "You're not getting me, Dad." It's frustrating, and Dad, we're going. Well, I'm seeing things that you're not, son, and you're not getting that. And so, like Dr. Noel says, he's found a way to just focus in on something compassionate that's helping him in that conflict that Dad missed. But equally, Dad was seeing another thing that needed attention. So it's a, you know. It, it, Beautiful stuff. Let's move on. So uh, jump over. Let's read a little bit about... I'm going to read it again because we only read the first bit. Oh, no, we didn't. When fowls came up and devoured them. Yes, we read that. Now, some fell on stony places and they had not much earth. Remember earth, by the way, when we studied the seven days in Genesis. Do you remember what earth is? Coming up out of the water, it's conscience. Having a conscience, a conviction that you can stand on the cow the waters of your thoughts and feelings. Land comes up, something to stand on, some conscience. Conscience is God, by the way. Conscience in you is God. Not much earth, okay? Only a small amount of affection and interest in spiritual life is present due to the harsh reality of the external life and the many molestations that evil and negative energy can inflict upon the advancing style. And you go, molestations. We know for how I said truth in heaven, truth and good are one, but on earth, truth and good are separate. But they're separate on earth because it's a part of what we need to grow spiritually. We need to deal with truth first, and from there, 
we learn an affection for what is good. But we don't start with an affection for good. The will is corrupt and it wants self and it wants you know, what is good for it. But after we have kind of a love and affection for truth, we learn what is good and we develop an affection for what is good. But if you have truth on its own, you've got to say, which is why they used to stone people. Let's find our stones up. Let's say stones. It says here, they fell upon stony places. The purpose of truth is to unveil, reveal, uphold, or manifest reality, in brackets, goodness. Truth without the goodness and love of God represents, reveals to us harsh realities. Or half truths, harsh realities. Murder, molestation, and all manner of crimes against what is human and kind will break and even crush the heart of the best soul. Is that not true? Like you could be the most compassionate person, and if you take the time to look at the world, it'll break you. We need to feel and to know the love of our Heavenly Father flowing into us today if we are to face the less edifying truths of life and rise into a revelation of hope, peace, and eternal life. So what I'm saying here is you've got to keep dipping into the love of God or too much truth will black pill you. Red pill you wakes you up. Blue pill you puts you to sleep. Black pill makes you lose all hope. Too much truth and you're like, I just can't cope. I run away. So we're going to keep dipping into the love of God that's how we deal with the hard truths in life, all the stones. And if you're a farmer, what do you do with those stones when you find them? If you're a farmer and you see stone, what do you do with those stones when you find them in your field? You pull them out and you put them aside for another use, don't you? Think about, think about how many times you've been talking to a fellow believer or Christian and they've got a truth they're not going to let go of and it's causing all manner of problems. Because this is the truth. But, but what about grace? Yeah, there's grace and mercy, but truth. Their stone is getting in, getting in the way. I often wonder, like last night, I was really just having a sticker on a car. Yeah, yeah. And it was, like, honestly, really, it says a huge sticker on the back of a car to save your child, shoot a pedophile that has a gun. I'm thinking, are you trying to come across as a nice, loving, protective <laughs> children? But you're actually. I started thinking about that pill. You've taken too much of the black, the black pill and you're, you've come across as cynical. And it's just, it was just disturbing. I mean, some people would laugh at that and go, oh, that's so cool. But what are you trying to hide? If you need to, I don't know. It's just a bit, well, well, you're absolutely right, right. It's because truth protects. So in that, the truth is to protect the child. But will you go to any measure? Will you, you know, will you... Um, what would Jesus say? What good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Mm. You know, like, yeah. yeah but, uh, that's what he said about the black pill. I thought, well, that's what he's taking. Or this Too black much black pill. Yeah. yeah. So we've got to find what's the answer. Take the truth. We want to protect the children. Let's protect the children. Take the truth. Marry in goodness. What's the right way to protect the children? Shooting people? No. Okay, if someone's going to hurt children, then what we do in society is we, we, we separate them and we try to love and care and protect even those people. But it doesn't mean you go and shoot them. You know, there's, there's, there's a way, it's just me. Okay, uh, we're going to, to crush the best soul feeling love of the earth. Kind of keep dipping into the love of the Father and all those truths will pull us down. Without tasting the Father's love, the truth will be cold as hard stones. Isn't that, a, isn't that a good thought, image? Only good for stoning people with such cold, and you could do other things with stones, such cold insights will not lead to spiritual growth and maturity, for they rob the advancing soul of heavenly affections, which alone make up the good soil in which the word can manifest its power. And hopefully that explains to you why some Christians have been following in Christianity for a long time, but they've just become bitter. Like, the root soul of God. But they're really bitter. You know what I mean? The, 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 it's all about the stones. 
But the Lord needs that softness of heart. Not a hard heart, but a softness. Yeah. All right, well, do you want to read the next bit for us, Sean? Sure? And then we'll stop there because we probably... And the face with the suppressed heart because they had no deepness. dependence of the words. Some initial spiritual growth following by a period of fading away. All right, so that, before we even read that, that really says something to me, but I want to see what it says to other people, because you know, the nature of the word is it's always revealing itself. If you've had a period of real excitement and growth, and then it fades away, we've all experienced that at times. You have a period where you're really excited, and then you go, oh, oh I lost that excitement, God. What happened? Sometimes I just need cold water to yeah, just have a shower with cold water. And to shock you? Yeah, to shock me. <laughs> and then, uh, I, I, you know, like uh, recharge me again. Yes. It's like that. This is about yes. my, I feel uh, this body actually and, uh, also can set up the, the environment that that your spirit, even I know the spirit leading the body, but can make your spirit cheer up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fast, fast, fast the body from pleasure and the spirit taps into that river of living water. That's beautiful. Okay, so when you are having a period of excitement or growth, and then you go, oh, I've lost, I've lost it. Last week I was so excited about that truth, and I've lost it. You've hit a period in your heart, that, you've hit an area in your heart that's hard. That's what the scripture is telling me. And don't be down on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. Just acknowledge it. Oh, I was really excited about that last week. Now I just don't want to know about it. Lord, I've got something hard here. Let's let's help me deal with this. And that's you know, it's a, this is day one spiritual work. Right? I've seen the act of love towards someone that's in the average community. You know, that's what gets me through. Ah. Wow, and that truth comes back. Again. Beautiful. That's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. That restores your faith in, in our sisters and brothers. Because sometimes yeah. it's especially with the world going on now, and then you get this refreshing moment, as you say, you get a taste of that water when you see it. And, and you know, being a parent, you love to see your children care for one another. And that's that, that renews me anyway. That's beautiful. So someone's just washed your feet by their kindness and their mm -hmm. acts. Mm -hmm. They've just, without even meaning to, they've washed your feet. We'll finish with this. There are times in our spiritual journey when there is a flurry of activity and it appears that the Lord is opening a new, lasting avenue of growth and development. And yet, farther down the road of time, we find that that new development has waned. Should we lament or attempt to revive that process? Maybe. The advancing soul understands that the importance of working with spiritual processes that are led by the Lord and not by the lower ego. Here in this parable, we are both promised and instructed that not every seed will find fruitful soil. It is important that we work to improve the state and reception of our heart and mind, that we endeavor to receive all that the Lord has for us in our development. Okay, so if I hit a hard, hard moment, I should not endeavor to try and soften that pain. What's going on there, Lord? I was really excited about that. And now this week I've just lost all current enthusiasm. What's happened here, Lord? Help me. But if the Lord doesn't put his finger on it, he shows you nothing. If you can't get to the bottom of it, let it go. Just leave it. But the ego doesn't want to let it go. I'm going to find out what it was. I'll figure it out the ego, and then we call this a world of trouble with the ego. Just let it go. It is so important. So much of our spiritual practice is just let it go. Let it go. Okay, and then we've got the last little bit here. However, spiritual peace holds within itself a quiet reassurance that even the lost seeds and the unexplored opportunities will not fail to serve some higher purpose. The advancing soul 
trust in the Lord and his process by letting go of what has been, especially when there is no clear guidance to return to such endeavours for deeper self-examination. So what's people thought? What do you think, Chris? What's our thoughts on that? Do you find some things hard to let go if you've... Definitely. Yeah, and it's... I think we sometimes dwell on people's mm. hardness too. Uh, mind after a fact, James, um, James' son, he looks at the good of everyone. Wow. And he's... <clears throat> I went to a knife shop because if we were a, for a gift, he got paid for a gift voucher to get my knife sharpened. But honestly, if I were these guys in this knife shop, it's not nice. Yeah. And they talk about, oh, he put the wrong code in here and he starts cursing. Now, I, I walked away feeling... But then you talk to him and say, I don't know about those guys, oh, they're lovely guys, they, they didn't mean it. Um, um, you know, he sees the goodness, and it's so nice to see that he, that he doesn't see the nastiness of them. So that sort of um, reevaluates looking at people with the hardness, I think, because it is hard to get around. So, like you said, I like is and hard. But is he too trust? Yeah. Sometimes he is, but the balance, thank yeah. you, Jane, the balance between truth, it's hardness. Goodness, it's so attractive and, and embracing. There have been people who've been too trusting and embracing and they're not here anymore. It's a, it is a balancing act. It is a balancing act. But at least inside us, I've said this before, but it's so good I'm going to say it again. One that I heard years ago, I don't even remember where I heard it from, but it's so good. You know, when, when you hit one of these moments, maybe you are ruminating on it. You know, I can't believe she said that to me. How dare she say that to me? Or whatever, we're ruminating on it. Right? Or whatever. It, don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Don't rehearse it. Just disperse it. That one has really helped me. So don't nurse it. Oh, I feel so bad, you know. It, it was such an unkind thing she said, or he said. Don't nurse it. Don't curse it. Wow, you know, she's a wicked whatever. Don't curse either. Don't curse I'll tell you what, she even says that to me again. I know how I'm going to say. I'm going to say this and this and this. And I don't know if your mind ever does. It's mine does. I came this yesterday. Yes, I have, I, I, yeah, this sun. You'll get another chance, Jane, I promise you. She's the bad, but she's the bad in me. But, um, yeah. You'll get another opportunity, I promise you. Don't, 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 uh, don't, don't rehearse it. Just let it go. I remember you said this one thing. A movie goes on in your head. Does it? That movie, so you got to cut the film. So I can't show the movie anymore. Cut the film. That's <laughs> you. Right? We have this movie going on, and you're right. And you've got to cut the film because it's on repeat. He was trying to get me to stop playing the, the film mm. that yeah I was having after I had. Yeah, this altercation. And, and trying to cut that film. <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a good point because you, you hear these, I've actually seen people say it on the internet, you know, do, do, do you think some people are, are even real? And then he's going like, like take a look at this guy coming down the street here. Do you think he's even real? Like, I feel like I'm in a computer program. He's not even real. Watch. And the guy walks past and he says something and the guy just keeps walking. You know, in this film. And, and I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, he's real, he's a living soul, but I like, to, I like that analogy, and I like to think of it this way. He's an NPC. And you go, what's an NPC? Well, when you play computer games, a non-playing character, right? So it's got a set script. Now, when, you, when you're awake, you're awake, but when you're asleep, you're following the script. And, and sometimes you're dealing with someone and they're just asleep. You're getting a script. They're in their movie in their head, and it's just ro the reels rolling. And no matter what you say, the movie goes on. I said, remember it. The, the movie goes on. But when you become awake, you go from being a passive consumer of watching the films to being a producer. Cut. Not watching this film. I'm going to edit this. Cut. That's the pitch. That's the film. That's the visualization I want to see. You know what I'm saying? Go from being a consumer to a to a producer. Like that. Oh, I don't follow cricket, but this week, because my friends in Pakistan, they 
Australia hasn't been in Pakistan for 24 years. There's this young bowler, his name's Nassim, and he's very aggressive. And the way he bowls, he was so aggressive, but it was interesting to see what the Pakistani people are saying, because the, the Aussie cricketer is wise, and he's the, the, the batter. He just smiled, that's all he did. And this young gets in his face, and it was interesting to see the spiritual aspect of the Pakistani people's response is a wise response. What a humble man, the smile. They <laughs> even said that. Yeah, yeah, and there were all these spiritual responses. Oh, look at the soul, look at that smile, what a response. Uh, so and the scene, calm down, you're like a wild bull at a gate, and there's all these, uh, but it's really admirable. I don't know how much they love their cricket, but seeing the response from the Australian to this aggressive young Pakistani bowler, it was very admirable. So I was thinking, what if it was the other way around in Australia? How would we respond? Oh, I got that, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They wouldn't see. He's channeling his inner bowling there, isn't he? He's, in a, he's using that energy to really to knock him out. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really good to see how diplomatic they were because yeah. they could see this, this young man was being in the wrong. Mm. I wonder how Western society, how we would approach that. Ah, oh, get him, yeah, be aggressive, knock him out. You know what I mean? It's so diplomatic in the, the approach. And that's a lovely thing to finish off. Everything is a spiritual practice. It is. But is it a practice that's putting you to sleep? Or is it a practice that's waking you up and making you a producer? Are you a consumer or a producer? So that's a, that's a lovely, you know, everything is spiritual, isn't it? You know, we live and dwell and have our being in Him. We live in God. We're in God. We can't escape it. It's just when we're living out of the senses, we're living in a, what was the word he used here? Deceitful way. What do you say there? Uh, towards the bottom, uh, uh, the second bit, he says, okay, he also that received the seed, it's four from the bottom of the, the second scripture, he also that receives seed among the thorn is he that hears the word, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the deceitfulness of riches. R riches are, are useful. They're energy. They get things done. They get a job done. But the deceitful part of it is that is that when we are using the energy of wealth to simply fulfill me, to fulfill self, then we're not being spiritual. We've missed that rich opportunity for this life to be to be to be. Uh, what were you saying about? that the whole goal of life is to become the compassionate being. Beautiful. Any last thoughts, comments? Yeah, it's very, just being a, a missionary, uh, we are uh, uh, you know, like a um, proclaim the gospel to other people, like an like evangelist. And uh, we, we just, uh, so many, you know, a lot of intellectuals uh, or movie stars, but some people very simple, very pure, and uh, you are uh, speaking uh, good news to them, uh, like a seize into them. Yeah. I can see those people, different uh, people, some people very arrogant, you know, you know, you know. and, and uh, so we are thinking in our spiritual internally, it's very similar that uh, people's group, like the environment, what the seeds are sending to them, to yes. the other people, and it can yes. be totally different result yeah, if, for sure. you know, in, in a very shallow um, in the soil or, you know, or, or sand uh, or get, get into the bush, people too much worldly. And uh, just, so we, we are we are so that uh, uh, missionary that uh, experience and uh, back to our internal things, we are pr sometimes simultaneously we can have the whole kind of things as a parable to explain. We 
we are not just one mm -hmm. situation, but there can be a two or three, four situations simultaneously. And you get that arrogant person, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. and then they go home, and they lie down on their bed, and then, the, and then suddenly that quiet whispering in their thoughts, and their heart opens up, and they receive what you said. You know, it, it, it's amazing that to the appearance, to the eye, the natural eye, their arrogance made you think they got nothing. But later on, the Lord found somewhere for that seed to get in. You know what I mean? Or in the other cases, you were saying, well, they're very humble and simple, but then later on in life, they've turned from God. Mm -hmm. you, you, can never, you can never tell, can you? You can never tell with the natural eye. Right, yeah. your, your word gives me a very deep feeling. Uh, the truth and the goodness in heaven yes. is united. Yes. One. Yes, it's one. One in the earth. They are separate. They have to be for the process. Every believer or every person's purpose of life is to try to combine the truth and the goodness together. Yes. Some people didn't believe in God, but they have the seed in their heart. Yeah. Everyone has the goodness in their heart by the Lord. Yes. If you can go up, you could getting the, 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 the truth and the, the good list together, you are going to up a little bit step. Yep. Then you put it further together, you move up a little bit further. Some 30, Eventually, some 60, some 100. You become <laughs> perfectly yeah. become one. Yeah, beautiful. Unfortunately, today, some people are focused on truth only. Mm. And uh, yes. you see. Bingo. 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 Yes, truth only. Too much emphasize on truth, God goodness. They also say goodness, but when they face some difficult situation, goodness is forgotten. And Paul said it this way, one. The letter of the law kills, but the spirit brings life. That's focusing too much on truth. Yes, we, can. we see so many examples. People are led to focus on the truth only. If you are talking something that different from their truth, you're ugly. Yes. Go away. One, one last thing I have to share, because you said it before, Chris, about the feeling. See, that's goodness. Goodness is something you feel too. It's not just intellectual, you feel it. The love of God, you feel it. We've been reading the, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia to the children. Chronicles of Narnia. And there's the bit with the four children, son of Adam and daughter of Eve. They finally, they meet the beaver and the beaver says, you're here to meet Aslan. And they don't know who Aslan is, but as soon as he says Aslan, C.S. Lewis says, something like spring filled the heart of Lucy. And Peter felt you know, like fresh, like smelling fresh food. And there was all this goodness filling. Edmund was like, oh, I don't like the sound of that. You know, he's the one that goes off to the white witch. But, but, you know, when we say Jesus, when we say Lord, Jehovah, our God, or we talk about truth and we, we really let our heart come into the affection of it, we think about living it, we, f we get that sense of spring or freshness coming alive inside us. And that, you know, that's goodness, the Lord's goodness, his Holy Spirit. He wants to increase that until our cup runs over, until we're spilling over with goodness. It's a nice thought, isn't it? Mm. Our cup runs over. Hey, Jane, any last thoughts? Well, only, like, we're talking about people that are just focused in truth. Truth. But then there's they people that only goodness because they don't, yeah, they're not accepting of, of I suppose, a spiritual, uh, yeah, of that. Yeah, so that they are, you know, that, Sweetmore calls that a, a, a remnant. He calls that a remnant. He said that goodness will be deeply protected inside the heart of that person, concealed, not really allowed to come forward until the point where their mind can receive truth. Then, then it can come forward and can be married and practice in their life. So that's a deep remnant that's... So it's easier for them once they get to the spirit world than the person that is only all about truth. And has no remnants. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's well said. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Dr. Knott? 
think the word we talk about truth and goodness is comparable to the mind and the heart. Nice. The so mind is usually nice. logical. Yes. So like, like a judge sitting in a mm. uh, pedestal and you know, pronouncing judgment. So he, he may not be truthful, but he's judgmental. Yes. He gives, you know, he passes an order, okay, you, you have won the case, I don't want the case. But the heart doesn't think logically, if you see. The, always the heart uh, works on an illogical ground. The love is illogical. You forgive. Compassion. You love someone you know, who doesn't deserve the love. Mm. You help someone who doesn't deserve the help. This is how the heart works. So the heart is contrary to the mind. That's why in all meditative processes, how do you stop arrest your thought process? If you don't think, then you want to start feeling. I like thinking about it that way because there's separation there. You know how we're saying that they're separated. We've got our head and our heart. Like, yes. Talking about that it that is, way really emphasizes the fact yep. that they are in separate places, or at least we visualize. And they have to be, Jane. They have to be, or we can't, we can't be regenerated. Sorry. They have to. No, no. They have to be. But, uh, but with the introduction of the inner sense, when the inner sense is allowed, see, the inner sense is not just doctrine. Doctrine is the way we talk about the inner sense. But when the inner sense is actually present in us. Mm -hmm. The mind and heart are one. There is a, it's, it's like you can see compassion and you can be logical as well because they're one. It's a higher logic. It's a higher logic. It's a, it's, it's a, that's why Sweetenwald uses the word wisdom, not logic. He calls it love and wisdom. And the wisdom of the angels is in complete union with the love of the angels. They're one. And that's the goal. But we're not angels yet, so we need that ability, as you say, Jane, to be able to step back and go, hmm, my heart really wants this evil. Hmm, it's not very good for me. It's not good for the other people in my life. What am I going to do about this? That's that power that having a mind and heart separate gives us. See, Swedenborg says the most ancient church, the first people who walked on the earth, didn't have that ability to separate their mind and heart. So when they began to become evil, they called it good and couldn't separate though, it's not good, it, just, it is good. I slit your throat and you blood, die and bleed and I take your stuff, it is good. You know what I mean? <laughs> they just, that's why the story of the flood, sweet, this is fascinating, sweet, the story of the flood actually corresponds to when the Lord allow the neocortex to be formed within us, the higher rational thinking. So we can think, even though the heart is still wanting evil, we can think and go, this is not good for me. So what about people that are pretty much purely evil? Like there's definitely people out there. I don't know anyone who's purely evil, have you? I probably would be dead if I had. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are people out there that don't seem to have that love side of things. Can, can I put you in another one? I think those people are in hell, and they're not on earth. But there can be people that walk the earth who are potentially purely evil, but the, 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 the Lord is still with them. I like to think of it this way. If they're breathing, the Lord's still with them. So he's with them, endeavoring, hoping that their heart would open up to goodness hoping that that process, but it still will always be their choice, Jane, does that make sense? It still will be. So yeah, thankfully, may we never meet such people. Uh, does that get to the answer? The cause for that is we are more materialistic. So we are sensitive to spirituality. So when they are more materialistic, you need to be evil. Because that belongs to the world, to the earth. You can't even think about what is spiritual, which is love. Well said. So the, the, the Western society is you know, fully corrupted with, with the materialistic thinking. The heart is literally closed, or is frozen in a way. So how to sensitize this is the challenge today. Okay, everybody wants to you know materialistic things, you know, beautiful wife, beautiful car, and houses, and 